Hi, we're with Peter and Midnight Madness. Nice. Okay. Right? Awesome. Thanks, Brian. All right. And we are breaking for it. I didn't hear it. Alright. This, this film is eligible for the this is a very important. This film is eligible for the Gross People's Choice Midnight Madness Award. You have the power to vote. Go to tip.net slash vote to do so and we would like to thank Elevation Pictures, Neon, AGBO, 30 West, Bloom, for providing. some amazing films this week. There are still more to come. Tomorrow night, the standoff at Sparrow Creek. Please come check this movie out. I pitched it yesterday as if you were in Sundance in 1992 uh, and missed the Reservoir Dogs. That's how you were going to feel if you missed this movie tomorrow night. It is an amazing, hard-boiled crime film with an incredible cast. Uh, definitely come check that one out. I also want to give a shout out to our closing uh, night film, uh, Diamantino. Diamantino is an insane, wild movie. Uh, it's got some of those crazy hallucinogenic images you've ever seen before. It's shot Super 16 millimeter. It's one of my favorite films uh, in the festival. I, I'm so, so, so excited about it. So please come check that out. But tonight, tonight we're going to see some red. We're going to see a lot of red. We're going to see a lot of blood. I'm all red. We're going to be watching Assassination Nation! world to be online and we've all learned a lot about that over the past few years. When this movie was made, um, I, I, I feel like uh, they probably didn't realize how true and pathetic this movie actually uh, is becoming and what is our reality. It is truly a horror film for our time. And we, we are going to meet the team behind this film, the filmmakers. Please give it up to Sam Levinson!
and, and that and that scared the shit out of me. And this script just poured out of me. And I sent it to a few people, the first being Kevin Turner, my producer. I love him, he's the best rated producer in the business. He read it, he understood it, and we started sending it around and not a whole lot of people got it. They thought it was fucking weird, it was too much, it was too edgy, it was too bizarre. Um, and, uh, and little by little we started to put together the kind of the puzzle pieces and get this film up and going. We shot this over 18 months ago. Um, I assembled the most beautiful cast I could ever, ever dream of. <laughs> You know, I, I think every step of the way, and this is from across the board, we dared each other to be more courageous and bold, whether it was, you know, who we cast, the way it was shot, the lighting, the design, the characters, the story, the structure, because what we wanted was to create a world that in some way felt like it, it mirrored the kind of emotional volatility of the internet. and. You may find it shocking, you may find it violent, you may find it absurd, funny, heartbreaking. Um, strange thing is, I wrote it initially kind of as a satire, and then by the time I locked picture, it was kind of close to reality. Um, and, uh, but at the end of the day, it's a love story. It's a love story between these four girls who have each other's back till the very fucking end. And, uh, <laughs> And I'm trying to navigate an increasingly chaotic um, and, uh, and confusing and fucked up world. And um, thank you to everyone who believed in it from the beginning. I, I'm so happy to be here. And thank you to my beautiful cast, my producers. Thank you to Kevin Turn. Thank you to my wife, Ashley. <laughs> I'm just, thank you for having me. I hope you enjoy this fucking movie. It's totally nuts. Um, do me a favor. If you like it, if it ignites some thing inside of you, if you love it, fucking tweet about it, post about it, talk about it, get people to go to the theaters. We open in 10 days. Um, it would mean the world to us. Thank you.
directors on it, and it was it was a long, kind of intensive um, search, and uh, I knew I had to find I, I knew I had to find Lily first, and um, it's funny I had Odessa's name written down in my notes just because I loved her name so much, <laughs> and I couldn't get a hold of her. I reached out to to someone I couldn't, you know, it was like months had gone by and I read a bunch of other people and finally I, I met, you know, uh, I Skyped with, uh, with Odessa. I remember opening up the Skype and she was like sitting in a bedroom in front of a giant American flag and I went, oh shit. Um, and then from that point on, I remember with, with Abra I'd seen this back magazine doc that was like five minutes long where Abra was like just kind of wandering around like London talking about, you know, growing up here and this and playing music and being in the studio, and I was like, she, she's like fucking electric, and she has this energy that's so infectious, and the same thing, you know, it was, it was, and then with Suki, it was the same thing, where, you know, there was just this kind of, this warmth she radiated, and, um, and it's all, and then, uh, Hari, I remember you came in the day after the election for an audition, and we sat down, and you read, and I thought to myself, just don't, don't, don't make decisions in the room. Don't make decisions in the room. Please, just, 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 just think of it. And I just, I, but it was so fucking powerful. I just, I, I, I walked home. I wrote, I wrote my producer's email. I said, this is it. We found Bex, and it, and it just went from there. And with Coleman, I never thought of anyone else. I met Coleman at Sundance a couple of years earlier, and I just knew he just there's. He has such character and such heart, and you can see it in his face, even if he doesn't say a fucking word. And I needed someone to just, just that kind of internal generosity and beauty. And so I called him up, I sent the script, he read it that night, and he was like, I'm in. I was like, fucking, okay, this is fantastic. So. Coleman, you've, you've got such a, a powerful scene when you're confronting the, the PTA, basically, and then the school population. What was that shooting that sequence like when you're, you really have to fight against a crowd that is just being absolutely awful towards you? It, it started out as, um, it, on the page, we, it was pretty well drawn, and we thought it was something that was pretty simple, you know, that I was going to try to plead my case and speak some truth to these people who know me. And they, they, we've known each other, I've known the children, they know my wife, et cetera, et cetera, and trying to talk sense to them. But then as we kept doing it, we just knew we would do it. You know, we would collaborate our sense. I meant, I think the crowd needs to get wilder and wilder <coughs> and wilder, and it's gotta get vitriolic. And these people who you thought were your friends and your family, they start to really turn on you. You know, just like, and then we, and then Sam got out there, and he was, he, you were rallying them up, and he was out there screaming, and then suddenly we were like, they should be saying, lock him up, lock him up, you know, because that was what people were saying. <laughs> and so they became, it was something, you know, this group of background actors, I don't know what it was, but they tapped into something. <laughs> and when I tell you there was flying froth and spit and, and people were shaking and then the, we were hugging each other because it was coming out of the, the collective consciousness that this was the truth of it, of what we were all dealing with and what we were enraged about. So it turned into that, and so we just let that dance happen, all right? Yeah. No, it used to be a full scene, and then we thought, well, wouldn't it be more interesting if instead of him finishing, they just fucking drown him out? Isn't that what would really happen? But it is surprisingly easy to turn a group of extras into a fucking <laughs> <laughs> to the rest of the cast, what were going through your heads when you were confronted with the screenplay and what you were going to have to take on? Well, when I first read it, I thought, wow, this is fucking nuts. <laughs> and I thought to myself, if I go out for this and I get it, if it's really good, it could launch my career. If it's really bad, it could end it forever. <laughs> but I met Sam and I decided to take a risk and I'm really glad I did. I just 
remember being really confused within the first 15 pages because I was expecting it to be uh, a complete satire that was making fun of and judging and ridiculing and discrediting teenage girls. And then 15 pages in, I was like, where's Where's the uh, where's the asshole writing the script? And then it you know, and then it was uh, such a pleasant surprise from that point on that this is one of the one of the first movies that I read about teenagers that didn't judge its characters. The party, I'm with the crazy shit. I saw it and I was like, yes, I'm all about it. <laughs> Then you mentioned that you know you began as a satire and now it feels like reality. Um, were you to start writing today, how would it how, how would it have changed? How would how would the story perhaps have changed? Would, would things start at an even higher level? Would they go to an even higher level and heightened level than they do? Um, I don't know. It's a weird thing. It's you know, I, I mean, we made this movie 18 months ago, so it's strange watching it now. And, and uh, I, it's, it'd be impossible for me to answer that. Only just for my own personal, you know, weird stuff. I mean, I, if I were to start writing it now, I would just be like, oh, fuck it, let's just make the whole thing the home invasion sequence and, like, fuck all the other shit. You know what I mean? Like, I would just, I'm like, I go down a, it's, it was right for the moment, and, it, and I'm really, really proud of the film that we all made, and I can't really imagine the moment. <laughs> Outstanding sequence. Can you talk a little bit about what was involved in constructing the sequence and even inspiring the idea to photograph it that way? Yeah, I mean, it, it originally was written as a house fire, and we didn't have the money to shoot a house fire, unfortunately. <laughs> well, at least with real fire, and I wanted real fire. I didn't want VFX fire, so I wanted. I was like, I went all over Louisiana trying to find a house to light on fire, but also be a house to shoot it, and I just knew it was going to happen. So. Our production designer, by Gracie Bill, we had found this amazing house, and he built a 3D model of it, and Marcel Rev, our cinematographer, who is my brother and collaborator, and I mean, his work is fucking astounding, and I just, I love him to death. Woo! We sat Woo! for six weeks, and we looked at this fucking model of this house. We went through every possible reference we could think of, from like Tenebrae to Angst to Black Christmas to Halloween, and we were going, how can we shoot like a, a, a scene, an invasion sequence that we haven't really sort of seen before, and that that in some ways mirrors, I think, this this feeling of the internet, and that there's always a back door, there's always something that you forgot, and there's always a way in. And we started to, we went to the house, we started shooting with iPhones, we started shooting it with, you know, we'd have, you know, our key grip wandering around from room to room, and you know, and we, we rehearsed it for about six weeks straight, and then we shot it in ten hours. Holy wow. crap. We got questions from the audience. Questions right there. Were you using real bullets? Were you using real bullets? <laughs> real blood. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I guess a qu good question might be just, what was it like to handle all that ammunition? Yeah. I mean, it was all, we, all practical weapons, there's no VFX, you know, um, stuff. And just, I don't know, there's something about it in terms of just the, the, the feeling of it, in terms of the performance, in terms of being on set, knowing, you know, knowing that you've got squibs and guns, it just, it changes things and it gives it a reality that, that you can't, you can't get from just, adding flashes into into things, so we try to do everything practically. Right there. Why didn't Lily get to get revenge on her jackass boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm oh, um, <laughs> Well, these are the things in life where it's just sometimes a shitty guy comes in and disappears and that's that. Give him the energy. <laughs> I know, it's... But it's also it's the movie not, continues past the movie yeah. too. I'm sure. It's not a whole other clown movie. He's fine. He doesn't even know. <laughs> children. <laughs> there was a hand over there as well. Yes, right there. Uh, 
that, yeah, did, did you ever feel like there was a tension between going too far? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the first cut of this movie was, you know, almost four hours long, and I, you know, I would, I think in every sort of scene, it's, it's hard to know where the line is, and it's hard to know where the line is in, in its totality. And so there, I cut this movie for about eight and a half, nine months, and I remember I only had one screen in this movie after I edited it for about six months. I take it, you know, and I was in New York, and I go out to Los Angeles and I show about like 12 people. And I'm sitting in the back of this audience, and I'm with Kevin, and uh, you know, the movie's playing, I'm going, Kevin, I think it was playing. And he's going, that's fantastic, fantastic, it's going really well. I'm like, I don't, I don't think it's going really well. No, but trust me, it's fantastic, it's fantastic. And I'm sitting there shaking. Literally, the screen ends, everyone, everyone goes, oh yeah, great, great work, great work. They will kind of walk away. And then I get a phone call from Kevin like 10 minutes later. He goes, I mean, everyone fucking hated it. I mean, it was a horrible screen. It was just horrific. And it was like, they found, and it was true because I had, for a while, I lost it and it became more nihilistic. It became darker. It became angrier in a way. It had lost its playfulness, its humor. I think that was one of the, the toughest things is just finding that balance. And I mean, this fucking edit humbled me. It was just, it was hard, and it's a testament to like my producers and my wife and the people around me who I love and trust, even my mother. My mother was like, I don't want you in this fucking house. Like, when I would go, she, would, she almost kicked me out of her apartment when I showed her a cut. Like, it was, I crossed a lot of lines, and then I pulled it back, and, you know. Uh, yes, right there. He didn't read the script. <laughs> <laughs> read the script. Oh, we have time for one more question, unless you have more to say. No, I didn't. That was such a funny uh, Yeah, I just, I really, I just, I really liked him. I liked talking to him. I, I like him as an actor, and he's fucking frightening in this. <laughs> yeah. <a> oh. <laughs> <laughs> We'll do two more. That one. That's the. That you're the last one. But over there, yes. The. Yeah. Oh. 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 Martin Coker. Martin Coker. Yeah. Yeah. All right. There you go. Suppose that. Teenager, I was I was a really angry teenager. I mean, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what box to fit into. Whether it was like you know, clothes I wore, the person I was. I struggled a lot with anxiety, and depression, <coughs> various things, and, and and pretty serious drug addiction. And you know, I ended up kind of getting my life together. And, and I've been clean for like 13 years. So if anyone. <laughs> I was, you know, I was angry, and I was thinking it. I was thinking about, I was thinking about that anger, and I thought, well, if I'm writing this movie today, and if I'm writing about myself, which I normally am, who is that? Who is that version of myself? And that version of myself is a teenage girl, because a teenage girl has got a lot of fucking shit to be angry about today. And and so I just, I, I kind of approach it from that perspective. And at the same time, there's. No one on the planet that is more inventive with language than teenagers, and especially teenage girls. And what's interesting about it is, like, if you want to know what a teenager's experience is, if you want to know what anyone's experience is that's, that doesn't share the same background or you know identity or ethnicity or whatever it may be, go online. They'll fucking tell you everything. They'll write think pieces about how they feel about life. And, and so it's it's like every diary in the world went public. And so there's more access than ever to look at the world from someone else's perspective. And that, I think, is, is I mean, that was a, a really big, um, I don't know, it was a big help. And, and then at a certain point in time, I rely on my cast, and I rely on my cast to say, you know what, this, the, this feels like bullshit. 
And I, you know, I do a pass based on the character, based on their life experience and write it into the character because as soon as you move that character a little closer to who that actor is, it becomes more authentic <coughs> and more real and, and, and more honest. And I don't know, that's, 